سبيل مريح تنا هدايا صاحي كي تستريح وغوث الدعاء الخفي الصريح يسعك الفضاء الرحيم الفسيح أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم
فحملته فانتبذ به مكانا قصيا فجاء
نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات آمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله 
أرسله الله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد من الله على المؤمنين إذ بعث فيهم رسولا من أنفسهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين صدق الله العظيم We are talking today about the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the live biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and one sitting it's impossible to encompass and to cover each and every angle of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is impossible each and every part of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is full of wisdom full of beauty full of nur and light and full of blessing and baraka and each and every account and each and every line and each and every paragraph about the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is full of those of of wise uh, feelings of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wise moves of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and full of signs of the prophethood of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam thus to try to cover the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from his childhood until when he left the world it's impossible to encompass in one city this is rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is a beauty it is a mercy an embodiment of mercy rahmatan lil alamin and the signs of the prophethood of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are many if one tries to look at the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam each and every step each and every part and particle and event that happened and occurred before the birth of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam during the birth of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and thereafter in his childhood when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam reached his age of youth and after that when before his appointment as a messenger of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala each and every part you find the signs of the prophethood of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam being evident and being revealed and being clear to anyone who reads the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and after his appointment as a messenger of allah and during that process when jibril alaihi salam came and thereafter when khatija radiyallahu ta'ala anha she uh, encountered the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in such a state when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in distress even that uh, uh, concludes that this is the messenger and true prophet of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thereafter once he was appointed as a messenger of allah each and every step of his life is uh, is uh, contributive of the fact that this is the messenger of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the signs about the prophethood of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are all the time evident in each and every paragraph of the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam how beautifully how beautifully uh, shaykh al islam ibn taymiyah rahimullah stated he said seeratul rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa akhlaquhu wa af'aluhu wa aqwaluhu wa af'aluhu wa shariyatuhu min ayati if you look at the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the statements of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which are the ahadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the actions of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the sharia that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came they are all showing and pointing towards one reality and that is that they are all part of the signs of the prophethood of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then he goes and he says wa ummatuhu and the umma of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam min ayatihi it is also amongst the signs of the prophethood of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam such a beautiful umma that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted our rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with wa ilmu ummatihi wa dinuhum min ayatihi 
the knowledge of the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and their piety and their religiosity and their religion and their deen and so on and so forth, they're all part of the signs of the Prophethood of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if one tries to look at the, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all those things that are inclusive and part of that life story of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam one concludes that each and everything points towards the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being the messenger of Allah being they, they are the signs of his prophethood sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he goes further and he says regarding the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was kana min ashraf ashraf ahli al ard he says that even uh, the Prophet ﷺ was amongst the, the, the most noblest uh, 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 of, of the people of, uh, the, of, the, uh, of the earth. So one sees that the Prophet uh, Prophet ﷺ was not chosen from anyone else, but he was chosen from the noblest of all the families uh, that were at that time. Uh, living in this uh, world and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted that prophet to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says وَذَلِكَ يَظْهَرُ بِتَدَبُّرِ نَصَبِهِ he says that when a person tries to ponder over the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَذَلِكَ يَظْهَرُ بِتَدَبُّرِ سِيرَتِهِ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam مِنْ حِينْ وُلِدَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ بُعِثْ وَمِنْ حِينْ بُعِثْ إِلَىٰ أَنْ مَاتْ if one tries to ponder and tries to study the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the time when he was born uh, until when he was uh, appointed as a prophet and from that time when he was appointed as a prophet until when he left this world he will find that each and every particle each and every item of the accounts of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are indicative and are signs that this is a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, وَتَدَبُّرِ نَصَبِهِ وَأَصْلِهِ وَفَصْلِهِ And he says that even if you go further and you try to dig into the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the city where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born, and also you go further and you try to ponder over the, the, the lineage of Rasulullah and his parentage, and if you try to look uh, as well at the, uh, at the offsprings and the family members of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it becomes evident that he is, is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all the signs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, and he goes further and says that you cannot see any dent, you cannot see any fault in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as if Allah subhanahu wa taala brought him. Allah subhanahu wa taala guided the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he trained him. فَأَدَّبَنِي رَبِّي فَأَحْسَنَ تَعْدِيبِي That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has trained me and he has been good in training me. So you see each and every part of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to an extent that the people of Mecca, they have never known anything bad about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They have, they have no record about anything that they can attribute that it's evil, that is bad towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Never has it been known with any, any, any uh, thing that can give a dent or can taint the, the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how can we do justice by mentioning Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such an important person, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one who is all the time being praised, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was in Mecca and uh, uh, when he lived with the people, we find that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was known amongst them as a sadiqul amin. That in itself is a sign among the signs of the Prophet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They used to call the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most truthful and the trustworthy. Even when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became Nabi, yes, after that still they kept on calling 
those who rejected the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they kept on calling us Sadiq al Amin. They used to call the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the most truthful and the trustworthy sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, up to an extent, Abu Jahl, he knew that he is the messenger of Allah, prophet of Allah. But Hasad, you know, uh, uh, jealousy stopped him. He said, oh, you know, we have been competing Banu Hashim. Our family comp competes with Banu Hashim in everything. When they started a service in, uh, in Haram, uh, we started providing uh, a different service in Haram. So we have kept on competing. Now they're saying that there is a Nabi. We can't compete. And that is an area we cannot compete. So what prevented him was the hasad, was jealousy. But he also knew that he's a prophet of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we find each and every part when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we find uh, uh, when he was born. Uh, before he was born, his mother says that a light came out of me when Halima came. With the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when Jibreel alayhi salam operated at the age of about six or so, uh, he operated the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Took a vein and washed it with zamzam and put it back. She was worried. She said, "Oh, something might happen to this child." She took back to Halima. Halima took back to uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's mother, Amina. When she came to uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's mother, she said, um, "We are worried. Something might happen to uh, your son." She said. The beautiful words of uh, the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She said, "There's nothing to worry about him. He is a special person. Inna lahu He is a special person." She says that uh, before he was born, a light came out from me, and that light shone the 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 palaces of Busra. And she says, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came out, when he was delivered, his delivery was an unusual one. He was placing his hand as if he's in sajda, placing his hand on the floor and looking up the sky. So she said, Intalaqi Rashida, go safe, go back safe, don't worry about my son. And the day when the Prophet was born in Persia, there was a fire burning for 1,000 years. The day when the Prophet was born, that fire went away. And before the the, the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, an important event happened. That is when Abraha came to destroy the Kaaba. And Quraysh, they knew they cannot face Abraha because he's come with elephants and he's come with a big army. They cannot face him. When Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, went to meet him, Abraha thought that they will you know, make a pact with him. So we find Abdul Muttalib, he didn't want to talk anything about politics. He was asking about his own stuff. His own, he said that, look, I've come to, you've confiscated some of my animals. I want them back. Some camels that you've taken. He said, I've come to destroy the Kaaba, something so important for you. And you are worried about your animals. He said that, Ana Rabbul Ibil. I am the owner of this, these camels. Walil Bayt Rabb. And for the house, there is a Lord, a cherisher, uh, Yahmi, it, he will look after. And then he goes back and he cries to Allah, Quraysh, some of them, they went on to the mountains to see what's going to happen. Abraha comes to destroy, Allah sends his army and destroys them. And the house of Allah remains as it is intact. So all these signs were showing that the Prophet ﷺ will appear. At the age of 12, we find Rasulullah wasallam. He goes uh, to Syria with his uncle. Uh, Buhaira happens to see and he finds that there are, this is unusual. Because uh, Quraysh used to come and they used to stop at that monastery of Buhaira. But, uh, you know, Buhaira would be worshipping and would never worry about the, the Quraysh. But that day he invited everyone. They, they came, they thought Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a small child, why should he come? You know, we are noble people and elderly, you know, have been invited. A small little child comes, you know, and joins us. Let him stay with our belongings. He will look after it. Buhera said, there is something missing here. Go and find, bring that person. So they, they brought Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he felt, yes, here there is something. And then he calls Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that, who's your father? He said, my father, you know, obviously, 
uncle is in place of father. Abu Talib says that he is my son. He says you cannot be his father. You cannot be his father. Tell me about his father. His pastor. His pastor. He said yes. You are right. Then he's asking about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his feelings, his dreams, and so on and so forth. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says everything. He says that look, um, I'll warn that you know the people in Syria, if they come to know about him, they might harm him. Take him back. So quickly as he completed his uh, dealings, he came back with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam signs upon signs we find that before he became a prophet each and everything the stones and the trees they used to do salam to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when jibril alaihi salam came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that encounter happened and when he said ikra the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said what ma ana biqari i can't read because i am an illiterate person who cannot read and we find that allah reveals to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the quran ibn taymiyyah rahimullah says fa ata bi amrin huwa ajab al umur wa azamha the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought this quran and he brought such a thing that it is an astonishing thing a great thing lam yasmay al awwalun wal akhirun bi mithl bi nadhir neither those people before rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the previous amongst the quraysh and the arabs nor the contemporaries had ever heard anything like the quran sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa akhbarana bi amrin and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us about those things that nobody had heard before sallallahu alaihi wasallam So we find that that is a sign of the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We open Surah Yusuf, yes, and what we find? Nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al-qasas. Allah says what? That we are narrating to you uh, the best of the stories. Bima awhayna ilayka hadha al-Qur'an because we are revealing and we are sending a revelation of the Quran to you unto you. وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Before that you were amongst the unmindful. Did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam know about Musa alayhi salam? No. Did Quraysh know anything about Anbiya alayhi salam? They were zero. They didn't. That in itself points towards the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the sign of his prophethood sallallahu alaihi wasallam. وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ You didn't know. When Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came back from Taif uh, you know we find Umayyah though he was a staunch enemy of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he saw the state the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in he called the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam into his uh, uh, orchard uh, and uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting on one side and uh, at that moment in time uh, he sent his christian slave to give a bunch of grapes to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says bismillahir rahmanir rahim before he eats that man said oh the people of this valley they never say bismillah the name of allah how can you say the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that uh, obviously he said to him that who are you he said i come from nenwa the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that you've come from the city You've come from the city of uh, uh, Yunus alayhi salam. He said, "How do you know about Yunus? These people are zero. They don't know anything about the prophets." He said, "He's Nabi and I'm Nabi, and I'm Bi Ali Musalam, my brothers." At that moment, he realized that he is a prophet of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. When he went to Umayya, Umayya started saying, "Oh, don't listen to him." Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Every part of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam points about the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam even if you try to relate and count the signs of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we could go on until 12 o'clock without finishing subhanallah and we find that uh, who followed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hum atba'u anbiya those who followed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the beginning they are the ones who follow anbiya ali musalam they were on the rich and the powerful Yes, and they were in those uh, uh, the ruling class. They were those normal, poor people, Ambia, and how they suffered at the hands of Quraysh, and none of them gave up their deen. 
And they did not enter into Islam for any interest. There wasn't any vested interest that we will get some wealth or so on and so forth. And they underwent each and every, every sacrifice for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khabbab ibn Arf. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala said that, uh, tell us about that time in Mecca, he showed his back. Umar radiallahu ta'ala started weeping, seeing that state, the back that the the fat of which was able to extinguish the charcoal burning on his back. Imagine how much he sacrificed. And he used to cry, he used to say, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because affluence came and the help of Allah came and the victory came. He thought that, oh, Allah is repaying for all the sacrifices we have done before. And he used to cry. Allahu Akbar. So look at the signs of the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, each and every, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept on calling them. And what we find, the Jews, they came specially to Medina because they heard, they had already read in their books that the Prophet will come and he will migrate to a place that will be between two rocky mountains and in the valley there will be palm trees. So they came specially there and they remained there and they sometimes used to fight with the Arab neighbors. And sometimes whenever they used to lose, they used to say, Remember, وَكَانُوا يَسْتَفْتِحُونَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Before, they used to say that when the Prophet of the last era, Nabiyu Akhir Zaman comes, we will believe in him and we'll take him and we will be his companions and we'll fight against you Arabs and then we'll win against you. And they used to say about the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Aus and Khazraj, they used to listen. But what happened? When the Prophet came, yes? فَلَمَّا جَاءُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا كَفَرُوا بِهِ How did they knew about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Allah says, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاهُمْ They knew about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the, the way they know their own children. You know, a person, if he's in a crowd and his son disappears and there is thousands of people and his son is somewhere there and he's scanning and he's looking for his son and he's looking and he's trying to track down where his son is out of all the different faces. And there might be some faces similar to his son, but yet he will be able to pinpoint that is my son. So Allah says, Ya They know the Prophet more than they know their own uh, children. And we find when the Prophet wasallam comes to Medina Munawwara. Ansar called the Prophet wasallam to come. Uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, he was a Jewish scholar. He said, I went and I started, you know, hiding amidst the people to go and see and to sneak and see the Prophet wasallam. And he says that when I reached and I came to the Prophet wasallam where he was sitting with Abu Bakr, he said, Araftu anna wajhahu laysa bi He says, as soon as I saw the face of the Prophet ﷺ, I came to know that this is a prophet of Allah. He cannot be an imposter. And he said, Awwal ma takallama bihin Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa The first words that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uttered, Afshu salam, wa'atimu tam, wasilu al-arham, wasallu bil-layli wa'annasu niyam, tadkhulu al-jannata bi salam. Spread salam and feed ta'am and have good relations with your relatives, good ties of kinship and uh, pray salah at night whilst people are sleeping. Tadkhulul jannata bi salam. You will enter jannah with salam, with peace. Subhanallah. Such a beautiful advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what a coincidence that the narrator is also Abdullah ibn Salam. Hmm? And the narrator is also Abdullah ibn Salam who entered into Islam later on. Uh, we find that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina, Munawwara. And on the other side, Salman Farsi radiallahu anhu. Salman Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He is looking for, for haq and truth. And he's going from church to church, priest to priest. And uh, you know, one priest says that look, don't go to the corrupt ones, go to this one. He is more pious, he is truthful. And he goes to the last one, he says, look after me, there is nothing for you. Uh, the signs of the prophethood, the last prophet are evident and it, he will come to this place. A place between two rocky mountains where there will be 
there will be dead palm trees. So Salman Farsi, he had some wealth. He sold it to, uh, uh, to an Arab tribe and said that, please take me to Arabia. These, they took him to an extent and they sold him as a slave. A Jew bought him. So he went to a place, he says that in that place there were dead palm trees, but there were two rocky mountains. I thought it might be this place. But then after that, another Jewish man ends up taking him. And he brings him to Medina. And he was there tending the tree. He was looking after the tree. He was up. All of a sudden, he hears a conversation below. A Jewish man is saying to his friend, saying that, uh, or his uh, relative, that haven't you heard the Prophet has come? You know, they're saying the Prophet has come, you know, amongst the Arab and so on and so forth. They were having a conversation. News had broken. So soon as he heard that, he jumped down. He said, what were you saying? I want to hear. What, what were you talking about? What were you talking about? He said, none of your business. And he gave a slap onto the face of Sanman Farsi. But nonetheless, he knew that the Prophet وسلم, has come because he overheard. So he was told that try these three signs. We know very well Salman Farsi came from a, from a father who was very rich. He was a property developer. He used to build buildings and so on and so forth. And he left his place just to try to find Haq. And he comes to Medina Munawara. And now he's got three signs to try to track down whether that person is a prophet of Allah or not. First is that he will not, uh, uh, he will not take sadaqah. That's the first sign. The second sign, he will accept uh, uh, hadiyah. And the last one is that the seal of the prophethood of Rasulullah will be on his back, which is a lump of flesh with some hair. So the first time after earning some dates, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, Munawar Masjid al Nabawi. The Prophet ﷺ is seated with the companions around him. And he says, uh, O Messenger of Allah, this is sadaqah for you. The Prophet ﷺ said, distribute among my companions. And he didn't take anything. So first sign is, tick. Clear that he is, you know, positive. The second time he brings again the dates to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, this, O Messenger of Allah, this is a hadiyah for you, hadiyah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, distribute amongst my companions and the Prophet ﷺ took some out of it. So the second sign has become evident. Now the third one, it's very hard to try to see that, you know, seal of the prophethood of Rasulullah He says that there was a janazah of one of the companions of the Prophet so he went there and he tried to walk behind the Prophet trying to capture, you know, whether he can, he's able to, uh, to see that lump of flesh. The Prophet felt that this man is after something. So the Prophet lifted his jabba. Soon as he saw that, he kissed the seal of the Prophet of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he started weeping. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what's happened to you? He said the whole story. The whole story he said, and he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, go and tell my companions, maybe their iman will become stronger. And he said, he entered into Islam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, each and every part of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam denotes that he is a messenger of Allah. And then when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in, uh, in uh, Medina Munawwara, Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimullah, he says, فَلَمْ يَزَلْ قَائِمًا بِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ أَكْمَلِ تَرِيكَةٍ وَأَتَمِّهَا مِنَ السِّدْكِ وَالْعَدْلِ وَالْوَفَاءِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remained steadfast on the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the best way and on uh, a perfect path uh, in terms of uh, truthfulness and justice and fulfilling all the treaties and also fulfilling the amana of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the Prophet Sallallahu kept on calling, لا يحفظ له كذبة واحدة There is no any record of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever lying. ولا ظلم لأحد Neither any oppression or mistreatment against anyone is recorded about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. ولا غضر بأحد Neither any deception against anyone. وهو على ذلك قائل لازم 
لأكمل الطرق وأتمها despite all this the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم then he says that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم وكان أصدقا بل كان أصدق الناس the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was the most truthful amongst the people وعاد لهم and he was the most just and we find وأوفاهم بالأهد and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was the most fulfilling the the treaties and full of honesty and trustworthiness ما اختلاف الأحوال عليه من حرب وسلم وغنى وفقر وقلة وكثرة وظهور على الأدو تارة وظهور الأدو عليه تارة Uh, despite all different circumstances surrounding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the state of war, peace, uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, prosperity, adversity, sometimes little having little, and sometimes having uh, enough, uh, uh, and uh, sometimes the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being victorious, like in Badr, and sometimes the Prophet, uh, the the enemy being uh, uh, victorious against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa huwa ala dhalik lazimun li akmal al-turq. And the Prophet ﷺ remained steadfast on the the straight path all the way, and we find hatta zaharat al-da'watu fi ard al-Arabi al-lati kanat mamluwatan bi ibadat al-Awthan. That until the stage came when the da'wa of the Prophet ﷺ and Islam became clear and predominant in the lands of the Arab in the lands of Arabia in the lands of the Arabs, which was full of polytheism, worshiping idols. ومن أخبار القوهان and also was full of the tales of soothsayers and ومن طاعة المخلوق في الكفر بالخالق and in it was full of obeying the creations of Allah سبحانه وتعالى in rejecting rejecting Allah سبحانه وتعالى in denying Allah سبحانه وتعالى and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم worked on them and he changed them. لا يعرفون آخرة ولا معاد معادا. They did not know what آخرت is. Did they know the Quraysh? They didn't know what آخرت is. What is جنة is? What جنة is? The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم يعلمون الكتاب والحكمة. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is teaching them the book and the حكمة. ويزكيهم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is purifying them and changing them. فصاروا أهل عالم أهل الأرض. They became the most knowledgeable amongst the people of earth. Allahu Akbar. So imagine within that 23 years, the tazkiyah, the ta'aleem, the teaching, the book, the hikmah, the sunnah, and their learning in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Huraira, how many years did he stay with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Four years. And how much has he brought to us in terms of the treasures of ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? فَسَارُوا أَعْلَمَ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ They became the most the most knowledgeable amongst the people of of the of the of earth wa adyanahum and the most religious and pious amongst them wa adalahum and the most uh, the most just wa afdalahum and the best amongst them cream de la cream حتى أن النصارى لما رأوهم حين قدم الشام قال ما قال الذين صحبوا المصيحة بأفضل من هؤلاء to an extent that the Christians, when they saw the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to Sham, Syria, they said, "Ma kana aladina sahibu al-masiha bi afdala min haulai." The disciples of Isa alaihi wasallam cannot be better than the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. فهذه آثار هؤلاء آثار علمهم وعملهم وآثار غيرهم. يعرف الأقلاء فرق ما بين الأمرين. He says, look, this is the legacy of their knowledge and their practice. Now you can see he is mentioning now about his own time. Now you can see the legacy of their knowledge and their practice. These institutions that you can see, masjid, masajid, marakiz, darlum, all these things, and you can see the piety in the people and people following the deen of Allah subhanahu wa taala. These are the legacy of their knowledge and practice, and the legacy of others. The intellectuals can see the difference, the black and white between both of them. Allahu akbar. So each and every part of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam denotes. His uh, uh, prophethood and messengership. Uh, I think I've still got time, yeah. <laughs> as far as I know. Anyway, so we find 
uh, that um, uh, Tabrani, Hakim, uh, Ibn Hibban, uh, they all mention Tabrani, the, 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 the narrators of Tabrani, all of them are an authority, thiqa. He narrates uh, uh, from Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam, he states that Zayd uh, ibn Zayd ibn Sa'na, he was a Jewish rabbi. He was a Jewish rabbi, and he bought from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam an orchard in lieu of eighty mithkal of gold. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took that. Uh, and obviously the Prophet ﷺ was made to repay and give him, meaning the produce or whatever from that orchard to him at a, a, a time, you know, at a specific time. This is known as Bayu Salam. This is known as Bayu Salam, which is allowed in uh, in Sharia, where, you know, you uh, pay, you know, the, the, the buyer pays, uh, forward paying, yes? And, uh, and, and the seller... Delivers later, isn't it? In reality, it's be madum, which uh, by principle is not allowed, but the lawgiver, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has allowed for, to facilitate the ummah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered into Bay Salam with uh, uh, Zayd ibn Sa'na. So he says, Qabla an yahilla waqt as sadad Before the time for repayment, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One is, you know, you have to wait until the time comes, yes? And then you, you, you have all the right to demand. But he says, before the time of repayment came, I came and I found the Prophet in, in the janazah of one of the companions. And the Prophet was seated on, uh, 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 near a wall. And I went to the Prophet and I held tight to the clothing of the Prophet I said, now could you pay me back my haqq? It is not time, you know, when the time comes, yes, bailiff, uh, then it's understood. Time has not arrived and he's asking for it. And he held, holds tight to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before the time arrives to pay. And he says, can you pay me back now in front of the companions, in front of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And he says, could you pay me back? This Jewish uh, uh, rabbi, he holds tight to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, pay me back now. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he says that I've only known Banu Abdul Muttalib to be late payers. Now he's rubbed salt into the wounds. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam still cool, yes, still uh, composed, smiling. Umar radiallahu ta'ala says that what have I heard from you? What have I heard from you? What have I seen? What you've done to the Prophet Sallallahu Had I seen any adverse reaction, meaning anger on the face of the Prophet Sallallahu I would hit your neck, meaning I would kill you. The Prophet Sallallahu turned to Umar radiallahu ta'ala and he said that both of us, we were, we were expecting better. You would turn to me and advise, O Messenger of Allah, pay him on time. Pay him promptly. Well, the time hadn't arrived yet, but you know, as a good advice. And to him, you know, calm down, you know, give, give a respite to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, go Omar, pay him what is due. Go pay him what is due. And together with that, give him another 20 sa of, uh, of debts. He, he takes Umar radiallahu ta'ala and takes him. And he gives him 20, you know, pays him what is due. As well as on top of that, 20 sa of debts. He said, why are you giving me extra to Umar? He said, because, you know, I really threatened you. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that, you know, I have to give you for that penalty. <laughs> I've threatened you. So, so at that mind, moment, he said, Ushheduka. He said that, uh, I, you know, I make you witness. I make you witness that uh, 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 I'm happy and pleased I'm happy and pleased that Allah is my Lord. And I'm pleased with Islam being my deen. And I'm pleased that Muhammad is a Nabi. So I said, I, you know, you bear witness that I am saying this shahada to you. So Umar said that, why did you do that to the Prophet? He said that 
on the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, amongst the alamat of nubuwa, amongst the signs of nubuwa, everything was evident. Apart from two things, and I wanted to test the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in them. One is, يَسْبِقُ, جه- uh, يسبق حِلْمُهُ جَهَلَ That his prudence and the sabr of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the humble of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the hilm of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prudence of Rasulullah will overtake his ignorance. وَلَا تَزِيدُهُ شِدَّةُ الْجُهَالَ وَشِدَّةُ الْجَهَلَ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا حِلْمًا So the, the, the toughness of, uh, of, of uh, ignorance or the ignorant people will not increase the Prophet ﷺ but in more prudence. And he said, today both of them have become evident. So take the, uh, Umar ta'ala takes him to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, أَشْهَدُ وَاللَّهِ إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Abdullah ibn Salam, he says that then he stayed with the Prophet وسلم, and he also witnessed all the battles and in Tabuk he became shaheed. Companion of the Prophet He was a Jewish rabbi and he entered into Islam. Sallallahu alayhi wa Should I stop or one more? Is there any time? Another five minutes. Okay. Let's mention about Adi ibn Hatim. At-Ta'i. Adi ibn Hatim At-Ta'i, he used to live. He used to live amongst his people like a king. He used to tax them. You cannot live like a king if you don't tax, yes? You need some money to have a palace. So you keep on taxing people. So he used to tax the people. Yes? You need some revenue. You need some to be living in luxury as a king. So he used to live a kingly life. And uh, we know Adi bin Hatim uh, uh, is the son of Hatim al Tai. He is very popular in the Arab uh, uh, history as a very generous man. So his son, he used to live like a king. And he used to follow a a sect between Christianity and Judaism. So once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent his companions to that area. So before that, he told his Arab worker, he said that, look, if you hear the companions of Muhammad visiting our area, let me know in advance and keep my horses ready. So he keeps the horses ready for, uh, for his master and he's waiting when he heard obviously these men they can hear you know because there's news spreading that the companions are here so he goes to Adi he doesn't say the companions are here otherwise others will also fly yeah he says you know the threat you know the thing that you're worried about is near code word so he gets ready and he takes his family goes and he leaves his sister behind Adi bin Hatim left his sister behind so the Prophet Wasallam obviously took all the wealth as well as the people who were there to Medina Munawwara and they used to come in Medina Munawwara to see that environment. So she is there, who? Adi bin Hatim's sister. Because Adi bin Hatim, you know, in that hurry, quickly he forgot. You know, at one point we used to come, my brother Dakir knows, we used to come here to read uh, Salat al-Taraweeh. So once, uh, you know, the brother gave us a car to drive and we were going back. With us, there was one brother who had his broken leg. And he's, he was walking in two, on two, uh, uh, you know, uh, sticks. So we would help him come up here in the masjid and uh, this masjid of Perth Masjid. So we were going back. We were young at that time. After reading uh, uh, Taraweeh, we were going back. So all of a sudden, the oil was falling onto the exhaust pipe. Fumes started appearing. So Brother Dakir was sitting here. He said, there's fire in the car. We were worried. Now, break. Somebody told, told him to break. He said, I can't break at this speed. But you could hear, you know, those small explosions happening. Bang, bang, bang. So as soon as he parked the car, everyone ran. The one who had his broken leg, he also ran and he forgot his stick behind so at that moment, you forget everything. And he ran. Here we were helping him, you know, to, uh, to, to climb the stairs. We would help. But there, you know, nobody helped him. He ran, you know, for his life. 
Uh, and he forgot his sticks behind. <laughs> so that what happened to Adi bin Hatim, left his sister behind. All of them come to the, uh, the, the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When uh, they came to the Pro Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's masjid, she stands up because she was a very confident woman. She stands up and she, uh, she said, Ya Rasulullah, halak al-walidu wa ghab al-wafid. O oh, Messenger of Allah, walid meaning father. Oh, Hatim al very famous man. He's died. As for wafid, meaning the brother who was meant to take, he's disappeared. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Mani al-wafid? Who is this wafid? She said, Adi bin Hatim. Adi bin Hatim, the Prophet said, Al Farru min Allahi wa Rasuli, the guy, the person who ran away from Allah and his messenger, she said, Ajal, yes. Ajal means naam, yes, yes. So the Prophet remained quiet. She didn't have anything to say, she sat down. The next day, because she was a very strong woman, confident, she stands up again, she says the same thing. Ya Rasulullah, halakal walid wa ghab al wafid. Oh, Messenger of Allah, walid, father passed away and wafid has disappeared. The Prophet وسلم, said, Manil wafid, who is this wafid? Again, she said, Adi bin Hatim, her brother. He disappeared, he left her behind. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Al farru min Allah wa rasuli, the person who ran away from Allah and his messenger. She said, Ajal, yes. The Prophet ﷺ remained quiet and she quiet. She doesn't know what to say. The third day she couldn't stand up. So maybe Ali radiallahu ta'ala said that try again. Could be, you know, there's no point, you know, it's a gamble. Try again. She stood up. And at that moment when she uh, stood up, she said, the Prophet ﷺ said to wait because there is tension at the moment. When the tension comes down, we will get you ready and we'll send you. When, you know, when there was some stability, the Prophet Sallallahu got her ready and sent with some companions. Uh -huh. And Adi bin Hatim is with his friends in Syria, yes, in Asham, with his friends and those who follow his religion and so on and so forth. So soon as Adi bin Hatim saw her, he knew that now he, she will emote him, yes. She said, where did you go? You took your family and you left me behind. He said, I'm really sorry and this and that. Anyway, she calmed down. Then Adi bin Hatim said that, you know, you were there in the Prophet's mosque. You were captured and you were there in the Prophet's mosque. What did you see? She was a very opinionated woman, very intelligent. She said that, look, I would say that my advice is you go and meet him now. If he's a king, then you will get dunya. If he's a king, what you will get? Dunya. And if he's a prophet of Allah, as he claims to be, you've got dunya and akhira. So Adi bin Hatim, obviously, he was a man who likes, yeah? <laughs> yeah? So that was a sweetener. He goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's mosque and he meets the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now in his mind is what? In the mind of Adi bin Hatim, there are two things. Either he is a prophet of Allah, as his sister is saying, or either he could be a king. Either Rasulullah is a king or a prophet of Allah. He comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he says salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, who are you? He said, I am Adi bin Hatim. He said, come home. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? I'll take you home. So as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is walking, an old woman comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she makes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stand and listen to her needs. And she's saying all her needs to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and quietly the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is listening. In the mind of Adi bin Hatim is two. Either he's a prophet or a king. He said, oh, he cannot be a king. <laughs> what would a king do? Huh? Go to that department, yeah? The finance department, inquire from the work and pension and this and that, yes? A king would say, go to the department of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala or Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam quietly is listening to this old woman and trying to help her out. So the kingship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being negated from his mind. When he comes to the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a small couch, you know, where you sit 
Yes, a small little seti like. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Adi, sit down on there, I will sit on the floor. What does the Prophet ﷺ say? You sit there, I will sit on the floor. If he was a king, what he would say? Sit on the floor. This is my throne. This is my throne and you sit on the floor. So the kingship of the Prophet ﷺ is being negated in his mind. Then the Prophet ﷺ said that, aren't you following that uh, sect which is between Christianity and Judaism, which is known as Rakusi? Nobody knew that. It was what? A secret sect. Nobody knows. You know, you secretly, nobody is meant to say that this person follows this. Nobody knows. How does he know? How does the Prophet ﷺ? Now the prophethood of Rasulullah ﷺ is being established in his mind. Is being established in his mind. So how does he know? Then the Prophet ﷺ said that, weren't you taxing people? Whereas in your sect that you used to follow, and that religion that you used to follow, it is prohibited to tax people? How can the Prophet ﷺ know about that? If his people knew about it, what would happen? They would say, oh Adi, you're following this sect and you're taxing us. And your own religion is saying they would all come out. Revolution would start, isn't it? Nobody knows. So it was hush hush, nobody knew. All the Prophet ﷺ said. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Adi, I know exactly why you don't want to enter into Islam. Because you see my companions to be very poor and weak. He said, wait when the day comes and you see the palaces of Busra will fall under their feet. And when you see the wealth pouring into them and when you see a woman who will leave Syria, yes, she will leave alone and she will walk in the wilderness of Arabia and she will come to this house, meaning Kaaba, and she will do tawaf of it and she will go back without the fear of anyone apart from Allah. Meaning security will reach that, that stage where nobody will touch her. At that moment he said, Aslam to. What did he say? I am a Muslim. Later on he says, I saw the palaces of Busra falling under the feet of Muslims. I saw the wealth pouring into the Muslims. And I'm waiting for that day when a woman leaves and walks in the wilderness of Arabia all miles, hundreds of miles, and she comes alone. And she does tawaf and goes back. He's saying, I'm waiting for that day. Because these are the prophecies of Rasulullah. And that also happened. And that also happened in the time of Uthman. A woman, she didn't have mahram. She said, I will go for Raj. Nobody is going to stop me. I'm going. Yes, yeah, sister, you don't have mahram. I'm not worried about anything. I'll go. And she was laden with jewelry. Full of jewelries. Nobody touched her. She went, did, and she came back. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's have love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our heart. The signs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if we keep on mentioning, the time is limited. We have to give opportunities for others to mention as well and to tell us the seed of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is full of parables and full of wisdom. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. Jazakumullah khair. The poem that I'm going to say now is uh, took place is about a story that took place in the era of uh, the Abbasi Khalifa Abu Jafar al-Mansur. This Khalifa used to be uh, a very smart Khalifa in terms of his memory. He had a strong memory. He could memorize things from once, from hearing them once. And he had two slaves, a boy and a girl, Jari and uh, Ghulam. The boy could memorize things from after hearing them twice. And the girl could memorize things from hearing them three times or thrice. So what he used to do is when poets come to him and narrate or introduce their poetry to him, when he hears it for the first time, he knows, he memorizes it and he stops them. Oh, wait, wait. I've heard this before and I've memorized it. And you know my rule, if, I'm, if I knew the 
poet poem, I wouldn't give you. And as an evidence, I have my. And he says it. So the po the poet says it once, and then he says it another uh, time, uh, twice. The boy memorizes it. Memorizes it. He comes and says it again as an evidence that this poem has been is is, is known. Is not his poem. And the boy says it to another time. So it's the poets and him and the boy. Then the girl comes. She says, oh, I also heard this. I memorized it as well. And he, he go, he go. He, he, he did that for every poet that comes and gives his, what's called, his uh, po poet. His poem, his poem. A sha'ar or a poet called Al Asma'i who heard about this and because all poets were upset about the situation. Every time they write a poem, go to him, he memorizes it, he says it after hearing it once, the boy after hearing it twice, the girl after hearing it thrice. Then he doesn't give them anything, they just work hard for nothing. So this uh, poet had a, a brilliant idea is I will make a poem that has very had that has a rhythm in it very confusing rhythm that so I would know what, what's the story behind it if there is a, a trick or there is something not not quite right in what he is doing and he did that and found out that this plan that he of his obviously after he has done that he gave him this poet no one could memorize it because of the rhythmic rhythmic uh, pattern in it and he said okay you give me what i've written he wrote he said the rule is if i hear it, didn't hear it i will give you what you've written, what, or the thing that you've written on, gold. So if I've re you've written the poet, poem in a paper, I'll give you the weight of that paper, gold. And this guy wrote his uh, poem in a piece of, say, a piece of, uh, piece of wood, marble maybe, say, this piece of big marble, maybe the size of uh, a door or a... Uh, say, I don't know, two doors, three doors. He read the poem in there. And I said, okay, give me what's my, what's called my, my, my salary or my gift. He said, okay, I will give you, I will give him. He said, okay, what, what you've written it? I've written it in this board or this uh, piece of um, marble or coil, actually, it was. And that marble, when it was weighed, <laughs> It came up that it would take all the money of uh, of of the country of the is uh, Abbasi Empire that time. We said, okay, I wouldn't. I would just give it away, and you would have to give every poet his share or his actual salary, without you know cheating and doing your business. You memorizing it from once. Your slave from. Twice you are other slave from thrice, then you you know mock people up or mock poets. Anyway, the the sto the poem is when it starts. I'll just give you to hear it. It's in Arabic, and as I said, it has a very rhythmic pattern in it. It says. Uh, صوت صفير البلبل هيج قلب الثمل الماء والزهر مع ملحظ زهر المقالي. وأنت يا سيد لي وسيدي ومولى لي فكم فكم تيم لي غزيل عقيق لي شربت من وجنة من لثم ورد الخجل فقال لا 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 لا, لا فوالولام والولي والخود ما للطربا من فعل هذا الرجل فوالولت وولولت ولي ولي يا ويل لي فقلت لا تولولي وبين اللؤلؤ لي قالت له حين كذا اذهب وجد بالنقل 
وفتية سقون لي قهوة كالعسل لي شممتها بي أنا في أزكى من القرنفل في وسط بستان حلي بالزهر والسرور لي والعود دن 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 لي والطبل طب 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 لي طب 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 لي والسقف سق 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 لي والرقص قد طاب إلي شوى شوى وشاهس على ورقص فرجني وغرد القمر يصيح ملل في ملل فلو تراني راكبا على حمار نهزلي يمشي على ثلاثة كمشية العرنجل والناس ترجم جملي في السوق بالقلقلني والكل كعكع كعكع خلفي ومن حويل لي لكن مشيت هاربا من خشية العقنقل إلى لقاء ملك معظم مبجل يأمرني بخلعة حمراء كالدم دمل أجر فيها ماشيا مبغديا للذيل أنا الأديب للمعي من حي أرض موصني نظمت قطعا زخرفت يعجز عنها لدبلي أقول في مطلعها صوت صفير البلبل صوت صفير البلبل Obviously after he heard this he called upon the slave his slaves and asked them have you heard this song before or have you this poet, poem before they said uh, the boy started uh, the first to, to the first chapter of the, f- the first uh, line they said صوت صفير البلبل هيج قلب الثمل and he just stuck couldn't uh, complete it because it was uh, the rhythm, rhythm starts from the second line and said just get lost of my of my way he asked the girl and she said no um, After that, I guess the Khalif, Khalifa decided that he would just give up his uh, cheating, cheating and uh, you know, jo- junky trick and give everyone his what's called his uh, yeah his his gift of uh, money when they write. Uh, that's all. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا وسندنا ومولانا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين من اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا بسم الله وقال الله تبارك وتعالى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الأبتر إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما درشي بليجي اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. Respected friends and elders, just before I give a begin, I can't resist the temptation to mention to you that my colleague and friend and senior Molana Zubair just mentioned that we used to eat together. What he didn't mention is that in those days he was perhaps thinner than I am now. So um, perhaps it was a process of eating together. That um, led to Molana's current fitness and health, mashallah. Allahumma zid, fazid. So, um, this majlis has been uh, established for the discussion of the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this indeed is the most auspicious topic that we could possibly select for a majlis, isn't it? Yes? Yes, it is also the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. The position of our Salaf is that there is no doubt at all that the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the greatest single ni'mah that Allah blessed humanity with. 
لقد من الله على المؤمنين إذ بعث فيهم رسولا There is no greatest single ni'mah There is no greater single ni'mah than this ni'mah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam That's our position It follows then that to appreciate this ni'mah and to observe shukr is very appropriate and it's wajib it's necessary and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's huquq and rights are so great in number upon us that entire works have been compiled on this theme. However, it is also our position and the position of our salaf that there are two official Eids in Islam. The Eid of Fitr and the Eid of Al-Adha. And we do not make any specific expression of celebration on any other occasion in the form of Eid, we do celebrate the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu How do we celebrate this? By performing salah. By worshipping Allah the way Rasulullah sallallahu taught us to. By saying, At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibatu As-salamu alayka ayyuhal nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim. This is shukr for this ni'mah five times a day at least and more than once in a single prayer. So our celebration of this ni'mah is not confined to a week or a session. And it is not our position that the appropriate shukr is to light candles and fairy lights. No. In fact, it's very interesting to observe, and I bid you listen carefully. It's very interesting to observe that there are so many books of a hadith which have a particular theme in their name. Think of, for example, Mishkatul Masabih, or the original work, Masabihu Sunnah, or Mashariqul Anwar An Nabawiya Al Mustafawiya, or Al Kaukabu Durri, or Al Kaukabu Dirari, or Lamiu Dirari, and there are so many others. These are works of hadith and hadith commentaries in which the authors and compilers have used themes in the name which imply nur and light. Shining star, bright star. Uh, Mishkat is the niche in a wall in which you place a lamp. So Mishkatul Masabi means the niche in which lights are gathered. And all of these themes, all of them come from Surah An-Nur. These ulama, in fact, Ibn al-Arabi writes a commentary on the Muatta and he calls it Al-Qabas. Al-Qabas, the burning flame, the radiant flame. In, in, in a forest at night, you carry a torch of, of a burning light to show you the way. So the, this theme, where does it come from? His theme comes from Musa al-Islam's story. When he saw the nur of Allah, as Allah manifest this nur in the form of the tree which was glowing, Yani, when we say this is, let me make, clarify here. This was creation. We're not speaking about Musa Sam seeing Allah. That didn't happen in the dunya. And as for Surah An-Nur, Allahu nurus samawati wal ard, mathalu nurihi ka mishkatin fiha misbah, al misbahu fi zujaja, al zujaja tu ka annaha kaukabun durriyun yuqadu min shajaratin mubarakatin la shirqiyatin wala gharbiyya. This whole ayah, full of intricacy and subtlety, is according to many of the Mufassireen an analogy of the chest and heart of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The chest is like the niche and the heart is the shade and it's full of the radiant olive oil and which glows before it's lit. This is an analogy to describe the nur in the heart and breast of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which shines out into the hearts of the Sahaba and it shines from them to the Tabi'een and Tabu'ud Tabi'een and that silsila continues to the extent that in this majlis we are gathered only because of this nur and light which is in our hearts in the form of iman and, and the knowledge of the sunnah and the knowledge of the quran so for us the light that is lit by the coming of rasulullah you just heard in the presentation of sheikh zubair that when amina gave birth to rasulullah she saw a nur enter into the dunya which filled the horizons up to the palaces of sham in syria 
So, so the nur of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so the, 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 the lights which we should be lighting in our houses and in our lives and on the streets are in the form of the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the form of the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, what I want to do in this majlis, and may Allah grant me tawfiq, is to demonstrate to you, to illustrate to you, so we can remind ourselves of the relevance of the sunnah to our lives. The relevance of the sunnah to our lives. I want us to walk away from this majlis refreshed and reassured in, 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 in that the Prophet Wasallam's teachings are a solution to my problems, to your problems, to our challenges. They are answers to modern problems. They are answers to the problems of the world. They are answers to the problems of Britain. They are answers to the problems of Scotland and Perth. I want to demonstrate this to you. And in order to do this, let us look at recent news. This week, for example, there was a news article, a very heart-rendering account of a schoolgirl who gives birth to a child, a teenage pregnancy. She conceals the pregnancy and then she eventually kills the child. Yes, you followed the news, didn't you? How many of you heard this particular news piece? Did you hear it? Yes. Yes. So this innocent child is killed by the mother. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I quote a hadith to you, Inna Allah harrama alaykum uquq al-ummahat wa wa'd al-banat. And the hadith goes on. It continues. Indeed Allah has made haram the disobedience of mothers and the Burying alive of daughters, of children. This particular act of infanticide, and let me just mention before I proceed, what are your thoughts about this girl? Are you angry or do you feel sorry for her? I personally feel sorry for the mother and the child because this is a lack of terbiya, it's a lack of knowledge, it's a lack of understanding. When human beings are deprived of humanity and guidance, they behave like animals. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came to the dunya to change the animal traits which had crept into human beings and make those human beings not into human beings again, but into angels. Today, yesterday, the pagan Arabs were burying their daughters alive. Until this day when you go for the ziyarat in Makkah, you can be shown the graveyard in which Arabs used to bury their children their daughters. And when Rasulullah used to take toba, bay'ah from women, one of the one of the things which he would make them do toba from was the killing of children. That they wouldn't kill their own children. Why would people do this? There are a number of reasons in Arab culture before Islam. One of the reasons was a fear of poverty. Who will raise the child? Why should I spend money on this daughter, on this child? Not always a daughter. Children were disowned and unwanted because people thought it was a liability. Let me warn you, as a Muslim, to believe that you feed your children is not the teaching of Islam. You don't. Allah feeds you and your children. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ We feed you and we feed the children, Allah says. Allah says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ and this ayah has so much emphasis in it that it can hardly be expressed in, in, in translation. Inna, the first word, one level of emphasis. And it's a nominative sentence, jumla ismiya. That's another level of emphasis. So it's a jumla, it's a sentence beginning with a noun, which means there's no tense. It's not confined to the past or the present or the future. It's a universal truth all the time in, a, in Arabic. Jumla ismiya begins with a noun. So this is one level of emphasis. It's Jumla Ismiya. Then it begins with Inna, another layer of emphasis. Inna, then Nahnu, Zamirul Fasal, a third layer of emphasis. Inna, Nahnu, Nazzalna, Adhikra, Wa Inna Lahu Lahafidun. Sorry, I'm referring the the uh, uh, the verse I'm referring. I want to refer to is Inna Allah Huwa Razaqu. And the same emphasis is found in here. It's a jumla ismiya. It begins with a noun. It, there's an emphasis before the noun. Inna. 
إن الله هو إز زمير الفصل إن الله هو الرزاق ذو القوة المتين indeed Allah himself indeed Allah himself is الرزاق the one who gives رزق رزاق and the nature of Allah's ability your attention please your attention children at the back it's for you this is for you so listen right إن الله هو الرزاق Allah is a razaq he feeds when you're at school you're taught about the food chain aren't you yes Allah feeds the human beings he feeds the fish in the sea he feeds the bird the birds which you see flying through the sky he feeds the insects he feeds the animals in the farms and fields he feeds everything and everybody everybody and everything all the time on a daily basis and but let me mention here if anyone goes hungry on earth It's not because there's a fault or weakness in Allah's rizq and in Allah's system. There are only two reasons why people go hungry. It's because of people taking charity when they shouldn't be. People taking charity when they shouldn't be. They should not be taking it. People who don't deserve it. Or it's because people are not giving charity when they should be giving it. People are not giving charity when they should be. There is enough in Allah's dunya to go around. There is surplus. There is surplus. And if the world would simply give zakat, and if those who shouldn't take it wouldn't take it, nobody on earth would go hungry. And this is a historical fact. There was a time in Africa when you couldn't find people to give zakat to because people were so rich. This was after Islam. The same Africa today which is considered to be a poor area of the world. So Allah is, إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ Allah is the one who feeds and he is the one of he is one of the one of immense strength dhul quwwatul matin so the point i was making is that in pagan in the pagan arabian culture one of the reasons why people would kill their children is because they didn't want to feed them and i was saying that as muslims this is not our teaching as parents we don't feed our children yes we are told to go out and search allah's fadl he's the one who sends the customer to the shop and it's he's the one who gives you the means it's if if you're working in some establishment some company some firm the fact that you're able to to maintain that job and it continues for you ultimately is in Allah's control so don't because you're on a fixed salary or something don't assume that it's not the risk coming to you from Allah it is and that can change overnight it can increase and decrease on a daily basis your bread comes to you from Allah he feeds you You don't feed yourself and you don't feed your children. You're just a means and a sabab. So this was one reason, infanticide. Another reason, they would they fear, feared poverty. Another reason was that the Arabs, this macho culture, the idea was that my daughter is my flesh and blood. Why should she be under the thumb of another family? It's jahiliya, jahiliya. Because women would be, women would be treated badly too. Women would be treated badly too. And so on the other side the on the one hand they didn't want to make their daughter a daughter-in-law of another family because they didn't want her to be under another family and on the other hand the other families would mistreat the woman too so this was another reason they didn't want to be uh, to be father-in-laws for a daughter they didn't like this relationship because they felt it was a comp- compromise of their macho status this was another reason and this is another fault we see this today in our culture too how there are many girls who can't find a partner because their parents refuse to marry the the girl to a partner who's appropriate for her but they think it's beneath them because the family isn't up to their standards or the family isn't from their uh, um, uh, tribe or from their ethnic background they, they see this as a problem if there, there's no difference in deen and they can get on with each other islam gives you permission Guf is an option, it's not an obligation. It's not, it's not an obligation. Particularly when children are slipping as a consequence of parents not facilitating marriage for them. So this, this was another reason. So we're saying, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. And the same men, the same men and the same people, even women sometimes, who would disown their own children and bury them alive, became the people who would run for the opportunity to adopt uh, an orphan. And to take a daughter, a girl into their care because they saw it as reward. And in Islam, there is more reward in raising daughters 
than there is in raising sons. There is more reward in raising daughters than there is in raising sons. Allah mentions daughters first as well in the Quran. يَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَاثَ وَيَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ الذُّكُورُ وَأَوْ يُزَوِّجُهُمْ ذُكْرَانًا وَإِنَاثَ وَيَجْعَلُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ عَقِيمًا Allah gives daughters to whom He wills and He gives sons to whom He wills or He pairs them up as sons and daughters. Allah gives you both as a parent. You have some daughters, you have some sons and He makes barren whom He wills. Some parents have no children, they're not fertile. Allah gives what He wills. So He mentions daughters first and Rasulullah Sallallahu gives us glad tidings of raising daughters on the day of Qiyamah, everybody knows that it's very well known that a person who raises orphans will be close to Rasulullah like these two fingers on the day of Qiyamah. The same virtue exists for raising daughters. The same virtue exists. People don't know this. So this is one example of relevance. Recent news, this is what happens when you are not guided, when the nur of deen and iman is not in your heart. Do you not think that this daughter would have benefited from an Islamic upbringing? What do you think? Do you not think that her child would have benefited? Do you not think that society would have benefited? And this is just one example. And this is why to teach deen is mercy and rahmah. And this is why to teach deen, if you give someone a morsel of food, this is sadaqah. It's sadaqah and it's mercy. But if you give them deen, it's a greater mercy. Because morsel of food will stop the hunger for a moment. But deen will save lives and stop bloodshed. It's one example. Let's take another example. Another example. Let's look at Britain, where we live today, we're, our society. One of the challenges of, 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 of today's world, today's Britain, today's Europe as well, is the economic challenge, isn't it? Yes? On a daily basis, you hear discussions about taxation and about the way the government is trying to... Uh, uh, reform the uh, the economic policies to ensure that there's plenty to go around. And one major area of concern is pensions, isn't it? Do we know this or are we sleeping? Yes, it's true, isn't it? Yes. So why is this a problem? Because elderly people are expected to fend for themselves in their old age, isn't it? Does Islam have a solution for this? The solution might be in your house. If you are a child, a son or a daughter who is caring for your parents in their old age, you are the answer to Britain's problem. Islam has solutions to modern problems. You do not need to establish institutions, old people's care homes. Today, you are a child and mum and dad, they wash you and bathe you and feed you. And tomorrow, they are the children, the children of old age. And you are looking after them with the same tender care and love that they did when you were children. It's time to pay back. In Islam, and I'm telling you this as a mas'ala of fiqh, and we have ulama sitting here, open kitab al-nafaqat, in any fiqh book of fiqh, the chapter which deals with your financial liabilities and responsibilities. If your parents are needy, it's wajib to spend on them, as it is wajib to spend on your own wife and children. Let me repeat this. If your parents are in financial need, it is as necessary to spend on them as it, is, as it is to spend on your own wife and children. Now, parents, don't abuse this. I'm not talking about luxuries here. Okay? Let's keep this in context. This is for the children. Parents don't hear this bit. Right? It's for where... If your parents are needy. So let us understand this mas'ala. So Islam has this solution. The breadwinner... I should be winning bread not just for his own kids but for his parents too when they are no longer able to fend for themselves. Not, not that you can't spend on them before this time if you wish to and Allah gives you prosperity. So this is another example. Modern problem, Islamic solution. Let us go somewhere else now. Let's go to the health system. Yes, the NHS. Is this a big subject in politics? Healthcare? Just in Britain or around the world? Around the world, isn't it? Yes? Now, the health system. One of the modern challenges has been when you've had cuts and privatization in the NHS, it's been hygiene, hasn't it? MRSA. Infections in hospitals. Is this not true? Come on, are you sleeping? Hmm? Yes, you're sleeping. No. Have you walked into a hospital and before you go into the ward, you are encouraged to wash your hands? Yes, there's, a, there's, there's, a, you know, there's gel or some liquid soap. 
and there's a poster showing you how to wash your hands, 17, 18 different... Can you smile? How many stages are there? Medical students. 16 stages of washing your hands in order to cover every bit, keeping your nails short, washing between the knuckles. Do you know that the hadith of Rasulullah covers every one of these 16 aspects? Every single one. According to the Hanafiya, it's mustahab to use a cleaning agent when you wash your hands after going to the toilet. According to the Malikiyah, it's necessary to rub your body when you, walk, when you do Fadl Ghusl. And in our teachings, is if you can't find anything else, you rub your hands in the grit to take away the bacteria and the smell. This is Islam. Pure Islam. Kitab al-Tahara, the first chapter of every book of fiqh. So when we wash our hands, we're supposed to wash up to the wrists. We're told never... The Prophet's famous hadith is When one of you wakes up from his sleep, he must never put his hand into the water utensil until he's washed it. Because he doesn't know what his hands did at night. And now let's explain the context of this. It doesn't mean that your hands should be wandering. Let me mention this masala for the old and young alike. Excuse me. It's not permissible in Islam to take pleasure from your own body. It's not permissible in Islam to take pleasure from your own body. Okay? So what the wandering of the hand means is that you might have scratched when you were sleeping and you might have had a spot and it might have bled or you might have been sweating in a hot country and there may have been some impurity on your body and that may have touched your hand. Do you understand the context now? Yes? So when you wash your hands, you don't pollute the water first. You don't pollute the water first. You pour the water onto your hand, clean it, and then you start your wudu if you're using a utensil of water. So the Prophet ﷺ teaches us from the fitrah to clean, to pair the nails. The Prophet ﷺ teaches us to clean, to wash between the knuckles, barnamij, to, uh, baramij. To wash baramij, to wash between the knuckles. This is the teaching of Rasulullah Sallallahu mentioned clearly in a hadith. And the use of cleaning agents is established in the light of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Do you understand? Do people not die because of MRSA? They do. People have, many people have died. Hospital infections which happen in hospital because the hospitals are not clean enough. Because doctors and nurses, clinicians, some of them, don't wash their hands properly after going to the toilet. It's true. And the consequence of this is these germs are passed on to human beings, patients, and they, they, they are infected and then it becomes, it spirals up. You can't control it even with uh, antibiotics. You can't control. I'm smiling because I have a friend here who rather likes his antibiotics. He takes them the way people take sweets. So they don't work anymore, do they? So, so the consequence, this is the consequence of, of, of not you, proper hygiene, this particular context of infections caused because of a lack of hygiene, not washing yourself. And let me continue with the medical theme. When a patient goes into theatre for operation, sometimes doctors take a swab from the nose and from the, from the hind, from the backside. And this is taken to the lab and analyzed to see if there's any dangerous bacteria on the patient's body. And then the patient is encouraged to take a shower. Subhanallah. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Did, do Muslims not wash their backsides when they go to the toilet? You know, I once had uh, a person who came to my house to do some work, a non-Muslim, and um, he commented, he was doing some work in the bathroom, in the kitchen. So he was just repairing something. And, 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 and he says, he says, I noticed, I've, I have some Muslim friends and I would notice when I go to their houses, they have a teapot in the bathroom. And he says, eventually, I was told that it's for washing. This is da'wah. When you live as a Muslim, your life is da'wah. This is for washing. So, so Muslims wash when they go to the toilet. And when you do wudu and ghusl, do you not take water up into your nose? These are two prime spots for dangerous bacteria. Two prime spots. And we have separate hands. One for eating and one for? For cleaning the body. Isn't it? Yes, the left hand for cleaning the nose. And by the way, let me mention this. Here in front of you all. Our shaykh was teaching us hadith. And he told us 
that this, the Islamic way of blowing your nose is like this with the left hand. It's not like this. Have we learned this now? Have we learned this now? Yes? So inshallah we won't use both hands for cleaning our nose from now on. No? We'll use one hand. Yes? Yes? Okay. And picking is out of the question. For Muslim. Muslims don't pick their nose if they're practicing, right? Okay. There's lots of other things they don't do as well. Okay? So basically, uh, hygiene. Another example. And I'll just give you a third example. You all like restaurant food, don't you? Hmm? You'd like to think that people wash their hands before they cook the food, wouldn't you? Uh, research in America, uh, samples were taken from lots of different... You, this, this particular research is interesting, it's some years old. You know, in, in restaurants, when they serve drinks and cocktails, right? What do they do? Sometimes they'll put a slice of lemon on the edge of the glass. Yes? Yes? So these slices of lemons were analyzed in, in the laboratory. And there was residue of fecal matter on the majority of samples. What am I talking about here? Evidence that the person who sliced the lemon and put it under the glass had gone to the bathroom and not washed his hands under the microscope. What does Islam teach us before we, what we eat our food? What does it teach us after we've eaten our food? Wash our hands. Is this not a modern, an Islamic solution to a modern problem? Is it not? And since I'm on this theme of water, let's move out of the hospital now to the public uh, arena of the gym and the swimming pool. Yes? I won't mention this because we want to be a bit patriotic. We're British, right? Which country in Europe has the dirtiest swimming pools? No, no. Um, no, no, I'm not going to mention the answer to this question. I'll let you do your own research, right? Um, I have to say though, uh, after seven centuries of Islam or so, several centuries of Islam, the Spanish still take a lot of showers, okay? And they also use water for, for, for? They also use water for, after going to the toilet. It's still normal there to do this. And in fact, they use the squat pans, the Asian toilets. And, if you want to call them that, and they also take the siesta, and research shows, shows that the siesta, the qaylula, the sunnah sleep of the early afternoon, lowers your blood pressure, takes away your stress, and it reduces your... If you have lower blood pressure and you're not stressed, then you're not likely to have a heart attack, are you? Less likely. Yes? And that's the time of the day, the time of the qaylula, when people are stressed. They've had a hard morning in the office or at work, and they're, you know anything will they'll fly off the handle. So the qaylula is... Possibly a solution to your personal health problems. Takbir? Allah. Allahu Akbar. So there's research on this. And, but we were saying swimming pools. Samples of pool water show that some swimming pools contain quite a bit of, quite a lot of urine. People have a leak when they're in the, when they're in the, the swimming pool. Rasulullah sallallahu taught us not to urinate in water. And this is not swimming pools just alone. If you go according to Rasulullah's teaching, you would have a cleaner Clyde in Glasgow and a cleaner Thames in London. You would not have sewage being pumped into the waterways of the world. You would have clean, it would not be dangerous to drink from the Thames. And the fish would be healthy. Everything would be organic. You know, the salmon, yes? You wouldn't have pollution in the oceans. This is the teaching of Rasulullah. Is that not a, an Islamic solution to a modern problem? Is it not? And we can go on. There are so many examples. Let's continue. Let's continue. Where should we go? Okay, let's go into the area of children. This is the time of the year when the parents are looking out for bargains, aren't they? Yes? And children know what gifts they want. Okay? Okay, we have our own reeds, but... Shopping time is shopping time for people, isn't it? Right? Yes? So, so what does the hadith teach us about toys? Does it give us solutions? Our kids want toys. What does Islam teach us about toys? Well, we can look at the Quran and we can look at the hadith of Rasulullah. Do you know that the muhaddithin, there are a hadith in the, uh, the muhaddithin and the muhaddithin give lengthy commentary on these ahadith. We know from the narrations of Imam Bukhari and others 
that Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha as a girl used to play with dolls. Used to play with dolls. They were rag dolls. They were plain. There weren't any specific features on the faces, but they were dolls. And she used to refer to them as Al-Banat, the little girls. And once she was playing, she was still young, Rasulullah s.a.w. came and she was playing with her friends and with her dolls. And Rasulullah s.a.w. said, what's this? And she says, Ya Rasulullah, they're Al-Banat, they're the girls. I play with these girls. Meaning the dolls. And the Muhaddithin talk of the wisdom of this. Next time you buy dolls for your children, change your intention, right? What is the intention now? The intention is that this is the house of Rasulullah s.a.w. And there's dolls in the house, right? Find rag dolls or make them. And the, the hikmah mentioned by the muhaddithin is that it's natural for girls to want to play with dolls. When they play with dolls, they develop in their maternal qualities of care and compassion. And have you seen how children, when they play with dolls, girls, naturally they want dolls. You don't have to tell them, what would you like? You don't have to teach them that you're a girl, maybe you want a doll. No, they, they want a doll. If you're a parent, you'll know, yes? Any boys here wanted a doll when they were small? Well, they want male dolls now, don't they? Yes? The, the, the action men and so forth. So, so, this is an example in the hadith of Rasulullah And in the Quran, Surah Yusuf, what happens? The brothers say to the father, Ya'qub al-Islam, أَرْسِلْهُ مَعَنَا غَدًا يَرْتَعْ وَيَلْعَبْ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظٌ Send him, Yusuf, with us tomorrow so that he can يَرْتَعْ Eat and play and we'll look after him so they want to take Yusuf young brother out for a picnic and some sports running in games this is what it used to be that's what the Mufassirin say it was running games and they would be picking the wild fruits of the, of the jungles and eating the, the, the wild fruits like very much like today you can go into parts of the countryside here in Britain and you can pick berries yes and you can eat those berries if you know which ones to pick, and it's like this around the world, in every country, there's always some wild fruits which grow and you can pick them. It's about eating, good nutrition, and it's about playing for youngsters. And the Mufassirin mention in detail, Yaqub did not object to Yusuf eating and out and, and, and picnicking with his brothers and running, playing running games. Yaqub only objected because he was concerned about the safety of Yusuf there's some parental guidance. Today the wolves are not in the form of wolves in the jungle. Wolves are in the form of mo wolves which will affect the morality of your children. What do your children, which computer games do they play? Which programs do they watch? Who do they chat with, with online? What messages are they exchanging? As a parent, it's your obligation. It's wajib upon you to keep an eye on them. Give them what they need to play and for their leisure. But, but keep an eye on them too. It's your parental responsibility. And talking about modern problems, is it not the case that the government is having to legislate about what you can look at and download online or not? Yes? Yes? Um, is it not the case that you can get into trouble with the law if you access pornography online? Is this not the case? Is it not a legal offense? It is a legal offense to produce pornography and to consume it, isn't it? Any doubt about this? By answer me. There's no doubt. So, as a parent, it's your, as a Muslim parent, you have the same value. You want to protect your children from this. So, you should be buying a router which is sophisticated enough and they're easily available, which has a parental control. You should be keeping an eye on what your children do with their phones and with their computers. And ideally, the computer should be in the living room, not in the bedroom. And they should be sleeping at night so that they can get up in the morning and not sleep in the maths lesson in school next day. Do you know some local authorities have had to discuss opening schools later because half the kids come in and they're sleepy in class because they've not slept into the night. So Islam, modern problems, Islamic solutions. But I'm losing myself. I've gone onto the computer theme. What was I talking about? Anybody remind me? Huh? Dolls, yes? And toys. Use Yaqub al Islam. Yaqub al Islam did not object because of uh, th that his child should, should play. He objected because of imminent danger and eventually he gave permission so we learn that a Nabi like Yaqub lets a son like Yusuf who's going to become a Nabi go out and run about and play and eat 
Islam is teaching us that children need the fresh air. Otherwise, they'll become couch potatoes and they will develop symptoms of type 2 diabetes as teenagers and in their 20s. And if you don't want that, if you live in a place like Perth, you've got no excuses. It's scenic, isn't it? This is not a nice place to live. What do you think? Hmm? You can go. You can take a picture out of your window and probably it'll be nice enough for a postcard. Yeah? You can send it to your foreign friends and they'll envy you. Wow, you live in such a nice, beautiful place. You're near, near the sea as well. Yes? True? So this being the case, so, so Islam is encouraging us to take our youngsters out, enjoy the fresh air, run and get good nutrition. Another modern dilemma and an Islamic solution. Dolls and running games. And these are examples. I can go on about this theme. Let's give you another example of toys. We learn in the hadith too that in Ramadan, the Sahaba, we're, we're focusing on the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Keep this in mind. Our Nabi, the theme of my talk, our Nabi, our teacher, our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam is a source of hidayah and guidance for us. For us personally, here and now in this life, in the 21st century, in 2015, in my house and workplace, in my personal problems, in my challenges, Muhammad sallallahu is my answer. This is what we need to understand from this lesson, from this dars, from this, this lecture. This is the, 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 the crux of what I'm trying to com communicate to you. So, more examples. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum would give their children toys, simple toys, to while away the time in Ramadan when those children were keeping their first fasts. Clearly mentioned in the hadith. They say that we would make woolen toys, min al from cotton wool and from wool. We would make little toys to amuse the children. These days, a simple toy might be, let's suppose, a paper plane or a balloon, you know, something simple. There's no cost that children will find amusement in this. What do the children do? They blow bubbles with soap, right? Yes, these types of things. Simple things. So the Sahaba would make toys out of wool or out of cotton wool and give these to the children. The children would be keeping their early fasts, the small children just getting used to fasting and they would while away the time. So the Sahaba are using toys as a tool for tarbiyah. There's an educational element. You take them through their paces but you don't make it tedious. You allow them to fast, but you support them as well. You in, 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 introduce them to salah and to sawm and to zakah. Don't go on a holiday. Show them the haram of Makkah. Show them the haram of Medina. And don't make it into a tourism visit. Make it into a visit of ibadah. Your children will love you for it. And this alone may be the point. I've seen myself. We take teenagers sometimes and the moment their eyes fall for some it's the Kaaba and for some it's the Haram of Medina you just see them no message no no lecture is needed they just the eyes fall they just soak in the environment and their hearts melt you see the tears flowing and this Muslim is a different Muslim to the one he was a few minutes ago permanently this person this brother this sister has had a spiritual experience and awareness and enlightenment of Islam which they had never had till this minute. After all, do you not go to your homelands if you have relatives abroad? Do you not go on visits here and there? This is the visit that you should be planning for your kids. So this is another example. Toys, I was speaking about Ramadan and toys. Toys for tarbiyah. Modern dilemmas, modern challenges, Islamic solutions. And oof, if I open the can of worms of marriage problems and family problems, la ilaha illallah. What, what can I say? Let me just say a couple of things in a word because I've touched on this subject. Remember, Allah Azza wa Jal has not given you a free hand. Ayahsabul insanu an yutraka suda. Does a person think? Does the does does a human being think that he'll be left alone, free to do what he wants, to while away the time? Alam yumna? Was he not a drop of sperm? Thumma kana alaqatan fakhalaqa fasawwa? Then he became a lump of, a clot of blood. 
Then Allah gave him form and corrected him and gave him his due proportion. He made him into a complete human being. فَسَوَّى فَجَعَلَ مِنْهُ الزَّوْجَيْنِ Then Allah made a couple, a pair out of them. الذَّكَرْ وَالْأُنْثَى Man and woman. أَلَيْسَ ذَلِكْ بِقَادِرِنَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُحْيِيَ الْمَوْتَى Is such a creator not capable of raising the dead on the day of Qiyamah? Indeed he is. Allah is capable. So as a human being, here I'm talking about marriage specifically, Remember, for the husband and for the wife, and for the husband to be and for the wife to be, you don't have a free hand. You have rights and you also have obligations. Here is a simple recipe for happy family life. In, 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 a, mari- in a marriage, instead of being selfish, huh, the age of the selfie stick, I and my name and my image should be plastered everywhere. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. This is feeding the nafs. And the, the ulama say that if you leave the nafs to its own will and desire, it will become Fir'aun. What did Fir'aun say? Ana rabbukumul a'la. He said, I'm the high most God. He claimed to be God. And he made his people worship him. That's what he did. So this self you know, to want to be celebrity. What is in it for you? What is that going to do for you? That's not the ingredient to happiness. It's not the ingredient to happiness. Always at it. Always at it. Taking images of yourself and posting them on your social media networks so that your friends can say, wow, how does it make you happy? Today, this is what I had. I had this for my lunch. Wow, subhanAllah. Yeah, yeah. I... My tire went flat, so I changed it on the right roadside. Here's my car. Here's the image of the car. What is this? What is this? It's nonsense. Yes, absolutely. Absurd. This is for people who don't have a life. Subhanallah. If you had any real human relationships, you'd be sitting with them. Like we are sitting here together. You know, there's this little... Someone was circulating this, 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 this little <laughs> joke, really. There's some wisdom in it. So I'll relate it. How do you organize a family gathering? You know, in a house, everyone's in their own little crooks and corners in their bedroom, someone's in the kitchen, someone's in the other room. How do you organize a family gathering? What do you do? You turn off the Wi-Fi. <laughs> then they'll all come out. It's like the power's gone off in the city. There's a power loss. They'll all creep into the living room. Yeah, what's happened? And this would happen at night as well, when everyone's supposed to be sleeping. So we were saying... We were saying, what we were saying? Huh? Where were we? Marriage. So, so everyone is selfish. Everyone wants to be pleased, appeased. I want my wife to make me happy. I want her to do this because I want it to happen. This, this, this. I've got 10, 20 things that I want. And she never does the things I want her to do or the way I want. And the wife, I want my husband to be this and to be this and to be this. It's always about me. It's never about the other person. Do we ever think? Does the husband ever think? This is what my wife needs from me. I'm her husband. These are my responsibilities. I need to show her kindness and compassion and overlook her weaknesses and her emotional weaknesses and her other weaknesses, whatever. And I can't expect her to be after several children the way she was the day I married her. And she needs to understand that my husband has his challenges too. I shouldn't bite his head off when he gets home. She needs to understand too. He's got his challenges and I need to be patient with him as well. So I need to, if, if, if instead of trying to please ourselves, if the husband tried to fulfill his duties towards his wife and forgive her shortcomings, and if the wife was to try to fulfill her duties towards her husband and, and forgive his shortcomings, you would have a happy marriage. Wouldn't you? Isn't it? Marriage is about compromise. It's about compromise. The perfection in marriage is a result of ignoring the imperfections. The perfection of marriage is, in the, is the result of ignoring the imperfections. Yes, if I'm perfect, then I can expect a perfect wife. If I'm not, then why should I? If, you, if you're perfect, then expect your husband to be perfect as well. Otherwise, why do you? And this is how it is. So we were saying, and the Prophet ﷺ's example, the Prophet ﷺ's example, in family situations, 
On one occasion, Rasulullah is in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, a dear and beloved mother. And by the way, let me say to you, to love Aisha is a sign of Iman. I could elaborate on this. I could elaborate on this. On one occasion, Rasulullah said to Fatima radiallahu anha, Oh Fatima, I love her, so you love her too. There's an instruction from Rasulullah to love Aisha because he loves Aisha. So let us all love our mother Aisha radiallahu anha and keep our hearts clean um, against the, 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 the propaganda of today's hip- hypocrites. In the time of the munafiqeen, they accuse Aisha radiallahu anha, Allah revealed Surah Al-Nur. The same surah suffices today and it will till the day of Qiyamah for anyone who raises a finger or an eye against the honor of Aisha radiallahu anha. So Aisha radiallahu anha, one of the other wives cooked some food and she sent it to the Prophet ﷺ while he was in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. That day, he was the guest of Aisha. She wasn't too impressed. Rasulullah is my guest. I'm going to feed him with my food. So the maid who brought the food, say that Aisha slaps her hand and the food falls onto the floor and the plate, the bowl breaks. And what does Rasulullah do? He said, he smiles. He's two women in, an in, 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 a, in a domestic situation, right? Special women, right? Two women in a domestic situation, in a certain context. Two women. Aisha radiallahu isn't happy. The maid, she's just had her hand slapped. The food has fallen onto the floor. And the Prophet smiles. This is the first thing. So when women argue, what should men do? Right. Yes. Not fly off the handle. No, no, there wasn't an argument here. But see, there will never be. You will never find faults in Aisha and the Prophet's household. You will find faults in your life. But from their perfect example, you draw conclusions for your own imperfections. After all, Rasulullah is a perfect human being, right? But he's our uswa, he's our example. So don't misunderstand the points I'm making here. Don't misunderstand the points. So, the, so Aisha radiallahu anha's action was decreed and destined from Allah so that it could be an answer to our problem today. This is hidayah coming to us from our mother, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the Prophet said, Gharat ummuk. Your mother has experienced an emotion of ghayra. Of ghayra. You know, you know, when you love someone dearly, you feel vulnerable when that love is challenged by somebody else. And this is what it was. They were devoted to the Prophet. It was nothing else. So they wanted the Prophet for themselves. So the Prophet, what did he do? He smiled. He said that simple sentence, ghayrat ummuk. And he picked up the food with his hand and put it into another, he gathered it up and put it into a plate, into, another, into a utensil. And he gave a similar utensil to the one which had broken to the maid. And he said, take this one. And the problem was, this, that was it. It's finished. On one occasion, one of the wives of the Prophet she had cooked some food. Mentioned Hayat Usab. And uh, she was asking one of the other wives to eat. They were both with Rasulullah Sallam. They were all together. And she didn't want to eat her food. So she says, if you don't eat it, I'll make you wear it. And she did. She put her hand in the food and she put it across her face. So Rasulullah Sallam took her hand, put it into food and spread it across her face too. Easy going in the household of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what happens in our houses? Why is the frown never always on the face? Why is the, the, the man always so angry? What's the problem? What's, what's, the, what's the issue? Why is the woman always so angry? Why can't you see the lighter side of things? Why do we take ourselves so seriously in family situations? But coming back to what we were originally talking about. What we were talking about, we were talking about the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is my Nabi and he's my teacher. He's my source of inspiration. He has solutions to modern problems, now and here, to national problems, whether it's related to young mothers disowning their children. And by the way, on the same day, there was another news article. The theme of children. There was another article about the number of women who disown their children early on in, infant, in, in, in infancy and give them up for adoption. Why is this happening? Where is this affection of your own blood and flesh? What, what, is, what is going wrong here? Parents don't love their own children. Children don't love their own parents. So we have the family situation. I give you examples of health, simple teachings of Islam which are solution to national problems. Give you an example relating to pollution, how waterways should be kept clean. And then we talked about toys, didn't we? And we talked about family situations. So these are all examples of basic teachings of deen which you and I know Islam teaches us to be good to our neighbors. Does anyone have a neighbor? Well, I'm not asking you to. Name and shame. If you have neighbors who disturb you, 
If you are a neighbor that disturbs others, do you mispark your car? Do you mistreat your employees? Not pay them on time? Do you uh, cheat your your bosses and your, your managers at work? Do you play the system? People do. I, do, I, I trust nobody does here. That's why I'd like to think that. Are you a Muslim? Of course. Yes. Are you a true Muslim? Should we not become true Muslims? And on this point, let me mention this final point. Yes? You know, in this environment today, in which everyone's eyes, the spotlight is on Islam, isn't it? Around the world. See this not as a challenge, but as an opportunity. Conduct your life in such a way that everybody that you come into contact is touched by your kindness, by your honesty. Be a courteous person, a courteous neighbor, a courteous family member, a courteous parent, a courteous child, a courteous decent sibling, a courteous honest worker or employer, employee. A person on the road when you're traveling, if you experience someone cuts you on the road and you feel furious and they then show you an insultive gesture or they pull down a window and, with their window and shout abuse at you. Don't respond in like fashion. This tongue of yours, this tongue which Allah created for his dhikr, for the Quran, this tongue of ours should not be used to shout abuse at human beings and swear. This is not the ethic of Rasulullah sallallahu It's not the teaching of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa so, so let us, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, aminu. O believers, believe. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, dhkhulu fi silmi kafa. O believers, enter into Islam fully. Wala tattabi'u khutuwaat shaytan Don't follow in the footsteps of shaitan. Let us begin by refreshing our iman, by acknowledging from the depths of our hearts that yes, truly, whoever I am, my solutions lie in the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Let us acknowledge this. Let us accept this. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا True Islam is for our hearts to open up and accept and embrace the teaching of Rasulullah without any reservation whatsoever. So whether you're a 5-year-old or a 15-year-old, a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old, whether you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s, whatever age, in your old age, understand that your solutions are in Islam. Our solutions are in Islam. They, and let me finish on this final point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent many prophets from Adam to Isa alayhi salam. In large numbers. And yet till and yet today, not one single prophet's message is preserved in the detail that this deen of Islam and the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu is preserved. You cannot even find the grave of any other prophet. There are opinions that various prophets are in Sham, in Philistine, in other parts of the world, but there's a difference in opinion of opinion regarding Every single prophet, the qabr of Musa alayhi salam, the qabr of Yusuf alayhi salam, the qabr of Ibrahim alayhi salam, there's difference of opinion. There is no consensus. There is no difference in the world, neither amongst Muslims nor amongst non-Muslims, about the resting place of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This has been preserved. This book, Al-Quran, the verse which I recited to you, I was wanting to recite the other one. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna la it's a promise from Allah that He will preserve the book and He has, pr- has preserved it letter by letter, word for word. In fact, you heard the brother reciting Sautu Safir al-Bulbul, the Arabic poem. This is a proof of how Arabic has been preserved through the centuries. This is a mu'jizah of the Qur'an. Otherwise, it would have been a dead language which nobody would have known like many other languages. Many other languages. In Islam, Muslim scholars, and this is unique to Islam as well, it's only in Islam that whether a scholar is an Arab or a non-Arab, an Asian, an African or a Chinese person, the, every scholar of Islam knows the language of his Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah preserved the Arabic of the Qur'an 
the grammar of the Qur'an, the tajweed of the Qur'an and the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu Islam is alive today. You may be seen as an, a stranger by those who don't subscribe to Islam because you choose to live in a particular way. That's your pride. It's fine. If others will show prejudice and discrimination against you because you're a Muslim and you practice the Sunnah, so be it. The beard is back in vogue. It's time for Muslims to have some haya as well, isn't it? What do you think? Not the, not the designer beard, but the organic beard, the sunnah beard, the one which Rasulullah kept and Allah grows on your face. Let it flourish. Wear it with pride. Wear it with pride. There is no hygiene problems in Islam when it comes to hair, is there? We've been taught which hair to keep and which hair not to keep and how to keep it. True? Yes. So, and for the sisters as well. Your pride is, you know, you know, let me just narrate an anecdote to you. An anecdote to you. Uh, this, is, this incident took place in France. A sister, France, today's France. Imagine, it's a recent incident of recent times. A woman was passing through the customs and she was wearing hijab. And uh, the woman at the customs, she said something, some abusive sentences to her. She says, you're probably ugly, that's why you keep your face covered. And Allah granted this woman wisdom. She didn't answer back. She opened her handbag. She took out a, a, a sweet, a chocolate, a sweet. She unwrapped it and let it fall to the ground. And then she trampled it with her foot. And then she took another one out and kept it in its wrapper. She picked both up, one in the wrapper, and the other she picked up from the floor and she offered them both to the, the woman at the customs. So which one would you like to eat? <laughs> she, she took the, first, uh, the, the, the one in the wrapper and put it into her mouth. She said, I'm not going to eat the other one. And then the woman said to her, well, the one in the wrapper is me and this is the woman who doesn't cover herself. The woman took the shahada. She became a Muslim. So I said to my sisters and to my brothers too, a woman is not a sexual object. She is a very precious gem in Muslim communities and societies. She, has, she is honored and revered both as a her daughter, as we've explained, as a sister, as a wife, as a mother. In every situation, Islam gives her so many rights. In, 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 it's not half and half. You know, the man earns half of the bread and the woman earns the other half. No, in Islam... The man earns it all. And if she has income, that's her spending money. She can choose to spend it on her family. The obligation is on the man. The honor that Islam gives you. Why should strange men be fantasizing about your beauty? That's your precious private thing. And you, your own spouse, your own husband, that's for him. Why should other people take advantage of you? You dress up for your husband and you'll have a happier relationship too. Not for other people. Not for showing people online what you look like. Your beauty is all the greater when it's full of the nur of iman. And it's preserved. It's pristine pure purity. So have confidence. Allah made you beautiful. Preserve that beauty. Allah give you purity. Preserve that purity. Preserve that chastity. And understand that your hijab, it gives you value. It gives you value and honor. There are many non-Muslim women who work in Arab countries. They go over as teachers and nurses and they begin to wear the abaya. And you know what? They start liking it. They feel much more comfortable. It's true. You can actually, there are examples of this. You can, you can, the interviews have been given by such women and so forth. They start realizing that this is actually great. Men don't, men that they don't want to look, there, there are many, they don't, they find that they're not being eyed up by men who they don't, they would have no inclination of being looked at by in a particular way. So, so they, they see that it preserves their honor. It preserves their honor. This is not bringing your status down. It's raising your status. May Allah grant us tawfiq to understand. There's so much more which we, which we could say. But let's conclude with this point. Um, let's, 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 let's conclude with this dua. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq to acknowledge and appreciate the ni'mah that we have. Uh, in the form of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our starting point is that we recognize Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as our guide in today's world, not in yesterday's world. No amount of pro propaganda against Islam should dampen your spirits. 
walk with your head in the air as a confident Muslim and prove them wrong by showing that you're a decent person. A decent person. You're an asset to society. May Allah grant us tawfiq wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah.